There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Yeah. Hello there. Hello there. Hello. Nice to meet everyone. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to you all today. So I think we, we are ready to start. Okay. Yes. Philippos. Yeah. We are 35 participants. I think is a very appropriate number to start. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, so uh, good afternoon, Francis. ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear students. It is a great pleasure today and uh, honor uh, to host uh, representatives of uh, two important companies of the sectors of energy and uh, infrastructure development and uh, 3D mapping. Helicon Industrial is a company based on Halkida in close proximity to Athens and to the main manufacturing and warehousing center of Greece. It is a company with advanced technical law, knowledge and, and experience, which provides specialty services of high level and runs numerous projects in southeastern Europe, catering to a growing energy sector with complex needs. Uh, the other company, Lux Modus, is a company based on uh, Calgary, Canada, which offers vertically integrated data collection and rapid, user-friendly and affordable 3D mapping solutions for mining, land reclamation, corridors such as transmission lines and rails, urban areas and uh, entertainment. We also have with us Dr. Filipos Spanidis, an executive of Asprofos Engineering, who was the key person to organize uh, today's meeting. And I would like to ask Dr. Spanidis to introduce our guests. Please, okay. Filipos. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Francis. So, good afternoon to the colleagues in Greece and good morning to the colleagues in Canada. So my name is Philip Spanidis and as uh, Mr. Pavlodaki said, uh, I'm working in Astrofos Engineering. It's the largest engineering company in Greece specialized in projects of uh, the sectors of energy and environment. So for the today's webinar, I would like to express uh, thanks uh, to the University of um, Western Macedonia, uh, Professor Francis Pavlodakis and uh, Professor John Kapageridis, and also Dr. Rubos from the Public Power Corporation of Greece. And also uh, thanks to colleagues uh, from Lux Modus and Helicon Industrial in Canada. So the, um, the basis of the today's webinar is to present the Lux Modus technologies and solutions in the mining industry specifically and uh, to have an overview on how these technologies are applied based on the experience and lessons from Canada where these technologies have been applied. So this webinar is organized in three parts. First, the colleagues from Canada may introduce themselves. In the second part, the Lux Modus presentation will take place for uh, approximately 45 to 50 minutes. And in the last part, the various Q and A's on the presented topics can be discussed among the participants. So we can continue with my colleague, Mr. Sotiris Nikas. Sotiris, the time is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philippe. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to our presentation. I'm Sotirios Nikas, the Managing Director of Helicon Industrial. I want to thank you very much for joining the webinar and giving us the opportunity to present to you some of the latest innovations in the 3D mapping technologies which were developed by Lux Modus, a technology company headquartered in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Uh, Helicon Industrial are the exclusive uh, partners and distributors of the Lux Modus devices and services in the Southeastern Europe area. Many thanks also to the PPC, the University of uh, uh, Western Macedonia, and my old friend and colleague, Dr. Philip Spanidis, for their efforts in hosting and organizing this webinar. I hope you will find it interesting. 
Uh, before inviting the Lux Modus team to proceed with the presentation of the technology, please permit me to give you a quick uh, overview of the services uh, that uh, Help and Industrial can offer, either directly as in-house services or teaming up with partners and associates uh, who we know for years. Uh, we had the, the, the opportunity to, to give um, a, a better, uh, we had more time and uh, we had the opportunity to give more details in a meeting uh, we had with um, uh, uh, PPC, Mr. the University of Western Macedonia, Mr. Uh, um, uh, Mr. Fragiskos uh, has, um, Pavlodakis has participated and uh, Philippos again. Uh, now I will be very, very uh, draft and uh, give you very quick information. Uh, so we give more time to the Lux Modus technology. So Helicon Industrial is based in Greece, as um, Mr. Pavlodak has said before, and this is a relatively new small company aiming to offer services to the energy and industrial sectors in the southeastern Europe, as well as transfer uh, innovative technology solution from North, North from Canada and North America in general, and not only. While uh, we're a new group at the organization, the team has decades of uh, combined experience. Our team of managers uh, and experts have uh, operation, operational experience from various parts of the world. So very quickly, um, I would say that our uh, operations um, are in four, uh, four um, main um, areas. Um, one is the facilities. If we could, could move the this uh, presentation, uh, Philip. Um, this one. This is the page, uh, Sotiris. Uh, yes. C can I can I handle it or not? Uh, just you. Uh, okay, leave it you, leave it here. So not. not yes, uh, I can I can so, to to give me instructions to skip the the, the pages. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. So our um, um, our um, Operation, as I said, um, uh, are in four uh, four sectors. Uh, one is the facilities engineering and consultancy. We have uh, uh, experience in working with oil and gas, hydrogen pipeline and facilities, LNG, hydrogen technology, carbon capture, utilization and storage, green energy, on-site 3D scanning, 3D and 2D mapping and GIS in uh, partnership with Lux Modus. Green energy and the energy storage. Uh, second sector is the asset integrity management, uh, uh, managing uh, industrial assets for life cycle of optimization, oil and gas facilities integrity, raw surveillance, again with uh, Lux Modus technologies, uh, specialty industry services and staffing solutions. Um, permit me to, to say a little more about uh, the uh, technical aspects of the carbon capture technologies. Uh, so this is something uh, very important for uh, uh, for for operations like uh, the ones PPC is running, uh, and uh, we can can share with you in a in a separate meeting, I guess. Uh, technical aspects of these technologies, as well as commercial, financial, and legal underpinnings. Uh, the last three points uh, in partnership with CITO Energy Group, uh, another uh, Canadian uh, company with um, uh, activities and operations uh, all over the world. Um, so I want to thank you again for uh, organizing the today's uh, presentation. And uh, I'm inviting uh, Mr. Uh, Joseph Hladi to uh, present uh, along with his team, the 3D mapping and uh, the GIS uh, technologies of Flux Modus. All right, thank you. Uh... Thank you, uh, Terry, for, uh, for the introduction. Um, and welcome, everyone, and thanks for the opportunity to speak to you this afternoon. Um, thank you, Dr. Spandis, for, um, for organizing this and, and hosting this um, kind of webinar and, and bringing everyone together. And, and uh, welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to just overall um, view or 
introduction to 3D mapping for, for mining. Um, I believe I can uh, share my screen here. Um, so I'm going to think that's this one. Philip, Philip take yes. out mine, please. Yes. Uh, can okay. everyone see? My, can everyone see my screen now? Yes. All right. Um, so I'm going to give a, uh, a, a somewhat brief presentation about uh, 3D mapping and, and asset management uh, using uh, our technology, and then I'm going to give a little demonstration or a view of some of the data we've collected in the past um, in a mine, and uh, and we can certainly um, answer questions as they come up, um, or at the end. Uh, we, can, we can answer lots of questions. Oh, I can click on that. There we go. So uh, Lux Modus, we are based in Calgary, uh, but we do operate globally. Um, Helicon in, in Greece uh, is our partner for uh, Southern, Southern Europe. We have a partner in Australia and a partner in the United States, and, and we do operate on a part, partner model. We are focused on the technology part, not necessarily the deployment part of the technology. Um, that's where we work with companies like Telecom to deliver the, the high value added services uh, to customers and, and projects. So we are specifically a 3D mapping technology company um, providing um, very rapid and high volume precision mapping capabilities. Um, most companies in this space uh, are low volume um, and it's a trade-off between speed or how rapid it is um, and the cost uh, and, and precision. We're focused on delivering as much mapping as we can at, at low cost and, and for our customers to have cost control um, of, the, of the mapping projects, um, but also be able to do it at scale. So um, from what I understand of uh, you know, potential mining projects in Greece, it sounds like a fair amount of volume. Um, and uh, you'd want to do it at a large scale. By scale, I mean lots of scan, lot, lots of data collection um, on, on multiple times. And we provide this capability um, to empower our customers and partners with the ability to create detailed digital twins of, their, of the assets, whether it's a mine or a pipeline or a power line. Um, we'll get into that in a, in a moment. Uh, but our technology revolves around three core components. Uh, one is uh, the Lux Gear, which uh, we'll, I'll show you in a moment. I'll go through all of these uh, in detail in a moment. But Lux Gear is the hardware part. It's the actual sensor platform that collects the data. And it's, uh, it's pretty unique uh, in the industry, and I'll go through that in a moment. Um, then we have the Lux Cloud, which is also quite unique in, our, in, our map, in the mapping industry. It's a fully automated uh, cloud compute environment that rapidly processes all the data you collect. You don't require to have uh, any skill sets in that area to actually get um, high quality 3D data out of, out of our system. And then the third part is the Lux Web, which is kind of on the consumption end. That's where the average user can go in and actually look at the data, do analysis on it, uh, download it or take that data and put it into other systems such as um, a CAD system or a GIS system or some other geomatic software or engineering software. That's the part where the average user um, actually gets to interact with the data. And we'll, we'll give you a, a short demonstration of that today as well. So um, for Lux Modus, our technology and our partners were involved in, in the main market verticals uh, for asset management. And that includes the built environment of cities and subdivisions and, and transportation, all that all the great stuff of the, the things that the mankind builds around the world uh, to map it and to continuously maintain digital twins of those, or at least a 3D model of digital twins of those assets so they can be managed uh, through time. Um, we've recently over the last year entered the, the rail market vertical as well. Um, we've had a lot of success in, in that space, um, providing a detailed 3D mapping at, you know, at a very small scale, large areas, but very small, uh, scale, as you, I'm sure you can all understand, a, a rail corridor is very, very narrow compared to something like a mine, but it's still long linear distances and an enormous amount of data. Uh, we're in the environmental space as well, which I think is applicable to this conversation. Um, this particular example that's on the screen now, I will go through a little bit later in the presentation, um, but uh, constantly capturing data um, of, a, of a particular asset and have that data actually align um, the different data sets through time align with each other 
uh, can give you a lot of information about um, the environmental changes in a particular area. Um, and that's one of you know, the, the values of LuxMotus because our data collection is quite inexpensive. It's more practical, it's, it's easier and, and more affordable to actually collect data on a regular basis as opposed to only once in a while. Um, and that provides great, a lot more insight into environmental challenges and, and things that are being monitored. Uh, we're definitely in the energy sector. That's actually where, as a company, we started, uh, was in the pipeline and upstream sector, uh, producing digital twins of large multi-billion dollar capital uh, pipeline projects um, and doing reclamation and, and abandonment of, of upstream or energy facilities um, so that uh, customers can see how well the reclamation has taken place and, uh, you know, and, and monitor the reclamation through time. A power transmission is also a large area for us, a large linear corridor. So again, it requires inexpensive mapping at scale for large geographic areas on, on, on a regular basis, which is what our technology is, is very well suited for. Um, and also mention all the images that you're seeing that I'm showing here are all from our system. So it gives you an idea of uh, what, our, what our technology provides. Then lastly, you know, the topic of the day is mining. Um, uh, we'll give you, the, the, these images are from the example we're going to show you today. Um, our system can be used uh, variously for especially open pit mining environments, uh, including reclamation of mine assets. So how we came to be, uh, well, was to solve one primary problem, really. Uh, well, a set of problems, but the problem really is the traditional uh, mapping methods uh, for large infrastructure assets. Uh, the traditional methods for surveying and mapping you know, surveying is very important, especially when it comes to the legal boundaries and property, people's money, basically. But in terms of just monitoring things like a mine or a right of way um, or a corridor, um, uh, you know, survey is, is, is a very heavy handed way to do basic observation and basic mapping. Um, traditional survey methods are, are very slow to deliver data. I think um, those of you familiar with survey can agree to that. It, it is very precise data, but it takes a long time to actually get it in the hands of an engineer. Um, or a designer compared to when it was collected. Survey is, is very expensive. It's a time and materials business because it's so labor intensive and, and it requires, sorry, uh, it requires um, specialized equipment and, and training, like surveyors are highly trained individuals. I believe Perry started off his career as a surveyor. Um, uh, and uh, uh, it can be at times uh, hazardous. You know, you're outside of a vehicle, you're manning equipment, and you're standing around in a construction site or in an environmentally precarious uh, environment. Um, and often the surveyors can interfere with construction and operation schedules because, they're, again, they're out there. They're not in a vehicle. They're standing around um, and moving equipment around. So it's, you know, the traditional survey methods are quite complex. They're analog. It's an analog method to create digital data. Um, and it's also very biggest issue that it's very expensive. So what we did is um, we all, everyone in our team comes from engineering environment, uh, EPCs and, and geomatics companies, uh, and they've all worked on large capital projects all around the world. So we're quite familiar with uh, 3D mapping and the use of technologies. Um, and I've been in the LIDAR industry myself for 20 plus uh, years. Um, that's what my graduate work was in, and uh, I've been in that industry for a long time. Um, so what we did is we took a whole bunch of existing mapping technologies, particularly from the autonomous vehicle um, and autonomous aircraft industry, um, and applied it to 3D mapping. Um, there are other 3D mapping companies out there that make hardware and so forth, but they follow the traditional um, uh, survey equipment manufacturing kind of business model, making expensive equipment that's hard to use and requires extensive training. Um, we didn't think that that really solves the problem or really brings 3D mapping and LIDAR to the masses for particularly for digital twin or for, or for asset management. Um, so we created our own system, uh, our own hardware system at least. Um, the other thing is one, um, pretty much all the systems that are out there for 3D mapping um, really uh, have a hard time on a construction site or in an, you know, don't work well in the environment. They're generally not weatherproof and so forth. So the service pipelines and mines and and rail lines and things like that. We created a ruggedized, pretty automated 3D mapping system uh, with ultra high resolution LIDAR, very high resolution imagery. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, very sophisticated cloud processing to eliminate the, the, the cost of people to have to process the data. 
uh, and it's a rugged ice system, so it can be used pretty much anywhere in any climate in any environment. It operates in the rain, in the snow, in the dust. Um, and it's mounted on a vehicle and it, it's very light. That blue box, our system is what's in this picture here, that blue box called chassis is about the size of a, of a, sh a small shoe box. Um, so it's really quite small and really quite light. A single person can, can mount up the system on a vehicle in just minutes um, and can operate it in a, in a, in a in basically an automated fashion. Uh, data, once it's uploaded to the cloud to be processed, is turned around and is available within minutes or just a few hours as opposed to days or weeks, which you get from the traditional survey methods. Um, and our system also produces industry, geospatial industry standard formats. So our data is not proprietary. It can go right into standard engineering software and standard GIS, geomatic software. Um, our system is also designed around a principle called target-specific remote sensing. So it is a remote sensing system where it's a, it's a sensor platform out there collecting data about, um, you know, about the the subject that you're interested in. So you mount uh, the system, the blue box the chassis on the mounting bracket um, in an orientation, depending on what you want to collect data for. So on the left is the downward facing condition. That's for when you're mapping pipes, you know, pipeline in a ditch or roadways um, or something like that. The up upward facing where the three cameras are, you know, are pointed upwards. Um, that is for collecting, you know, if you're mapping power lines or buildings or something like that. Um, and you don't care about the, the roads, you know, so all your dollars are you're spending on this are focused on just the target of interest. You're not collecting data about everything. You're, you're very specific in what you're collecting data on. And then there's the horizontal position. This would be for mapping, like, uh, you know, one example is mining. The examples we're going to show today are our data collected in this position, in the horizontal position here. Whoops. Um, it can also, it's also used for roadway mapping. So forth. So, depending on what your subject, what you're trying to collect, and the type of data you want, you mount the system in a configuration to maximize um, the sensor direction and, and the processing of that data for that specific subject, uh, which is pretty unique in our industry. Pretty much, as far as I know, all other systems out there collect data in all directions all the time. So, a lot of money is actually based on on data that you're not actually actually interested in. Just gonna. Pardon me, um, I don't want to sneeze here. So in general, um, back to, to the digital twin and, and 3D mapping, um, our focus, all of our customers are focused on creating you know, very specific 3D models and maps uh, of their assets. And that's to support kind of, you know, a digital twin philosophy generally. That you don't have to have a digital twin philosophy, um, but it's something we're just speaking about here. Um, you know, the, the data we collect, especially in a, in a monitoring program or a recognition program, you need a baseline of data, and that's what a digital twin does. Like, for example, we're on a whole bunch of pipeline uh, projects right now. Um, the customers out there constructing new pipelines are scanning with our data, so they get a 3D model of that asset, of that pipeline, just before it's buried. So they have a baseline of what that pipeline looks like in the ground. And then for the life of that pipeline, um, they can collect all the other data, all the environmental monitoring data, all the operational data, um, you know, and, and they can monitor that asset. Time. So um, a digital twin or creating a 3D, uh, a 3D model of an asset provides that baseline. It, you know, it provides, you know, LIDAR, like you know, 3D visual data, as well as high resolution imagery of the quality of the work that's being done. So say if you're building something, you get a time series of photographs and 3D data of the construction of it. So you can prove what was done. Um, same with on, a rec on reclamation or abandonment. Um, if you're recovering a mine, for example, and bring it back to the environment, that process of how, what you go through um, to, to reclaim that mine, you can basically document in 3D that, that process and prove it to regulators, prove it to the stakeholders and to the government. Um, and then through the life of that asset, even after reclamation, the regular updates of geospatial data, whether it's satellite imagery or environmental data, someone's gone out to collect water samples and things like that, um, can all be applied to that digital twin and you can do a, a much more detailed analysis once you have that baseline of that asset um, uh, of this from, a, from a starting point. Um, into the details of our system, uh, this is actually a picture on the left of is our system mounted just off the back of a truck um, facing backwards. It doesn't matter which direction our system uh, uh, points at any given time. 
uh, for an open pit mine here in Canada. Um, it's mounted up like, like that it, within minutes. Some customers basically permanently mounted on, mounted on a vehicle. So it's just there all the time and they turn it on when they need it. They want to, they're out going to collect some data. They just turn it on and collect some data. Um, it's um, one of the good things about collecting 3D data from a vehicle, um, not from a drone and not by people out walking around. It's much safer being in a vehicle. Um, you have less environmental concerns. You can get from point A to point B a lot faster. It's very, very efficient. Um, and our system has a very seamless workflow. It basically it doesn't even have an on and off button, basically. Uh, it powers up with the vehicle and you have a laptop in, in the cab of the vehicle and uh, from which you can monitor the collection of data. You can see the photographs that you're collecting and you just hit start and stop record and it just reports data and it stores it all on, on the laptop. So it can be operated by a single operator who's really just driving around. Um, the system called that one platform collects everything you need, collects the LIDAR, collects the imagery, collects the GPS or GNS data uh, for positioning the system um, uh, and all the storage and everything is all self-contained on one device. So this is where that cost effectiveness of our system comes in. You don't need uh, special licenses. You don't need special training. The train to operate our system takes about 15 minutes. Um, and what, what's more important is the familiarity of the, of the data you want to collect, like you're you know, wanting to collect in a mine or a pipeline or power lines, just familiar with that, more familiar with that workflow, which all of our customers are, than about actually operating uh, our system. The data can also be preliminarily included in the field, at least the imagery can, and the map of where you've gone and collected. So you can see right in the field, did I collect the data I wanted to collect the data? And if not, oh, I better go back there. If I missed an area, I better go back and collect that. So you're not missing out. You're not coming back, uploading the data and realize, oh, um, I forgot to collect this one area or the, you know, there, there was something in the way, so I didn't get a good picture of it. So you, you can, when you're out in the field, you can make sure you actually collect that, uh, that you want to collect. Then uh, at the end of the day, um, the data from the laptop is just uploaded, dragged and drop, or you know, if you would upload it, you know, one step upload to our cloud and our cloud processing environment automatically processes all the data. There's nothing else anyone has to do. Most of our customers uh, or partners at the end of the day, they go and collect all this data. It's part of their other day. You know, they get back to the office, plug in their laptop and they just click it and they upload the data to the cloud. It takes a bit of time to upload and that's all they do and it's done. And as soon as it's after minutes after it's been uploaded, uh, you can go and view it in our Lux viewer that I'm going to show uh, uh, show in a moment, um, and, uh, and and look at the actual data. Uh, it automatically our cloud processing automatically registers all the data. Um, when you get base station data or ground control data, you can upload that, uh, and it will automatically pro pro uh, further process the data to be more spatially correct. And all the imagery that's collected is all indexed. Uh, it's all cleaned and corrected. It's cropped um, and is ready to go into a GIS or other um, uh, asset management system as well. So it's just not a bunch of images that you can look at in our viewer. You can put it into a GIS or something like that. So if you want to see the image of this one thing through time, you know, you can go in your GIS and bring up all the images of that of that one spot that's been collected uh, over time. That's all done automatically uh, in our system. So that's another savings for our customers as they don't have to take specialized training to get the post-process GPS data or LIDAR data. Um, there's that value added part if you want to do analytics and so forth, but that's where the consultancy with like um, a Helicon um, or an engineering company would come in. This is something the Helicon would offer is all the additional high value added geospatial analysis or environmental analysis. Um, and we, we support those services as well for, um, for customers. Uh, then the final part, and, I, and I'll demonstrate our, our Lux Web to you in a moment. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, Lux Web is the is the part of our system where you can actually consume the data. It's a web browser. You go in um, and you can actually look at the data, do basic measurements and analysis, uh, do data management. Say, oh, I don't need this file, and I'll delete it. Um, or I really want this photograph, so I'll just click on it and um, uh, download it or share it with a colleague. Um, and then you can also export all of your data. All other GIS systems and so forth. Um, and because it's a 100% browser-based system, there's no downloads of software to install on your computer or anything. So you can literally be out in the field or at the mine site um, or at a conference somewhere or on a webinar like today uh, and just open up the browser and, and look at the data and share it with people. We've got lots of customers that are out in the field and just on their iPhones, they're, they're looking at data, looking at imagery um, right on site of what was collected the day before kind of thing. 
Um, just to get into a little specifics, this is a, a pipeline example, uh, but this is just an example of the output. Um, the image on the left is, uh, is a mosaic of, of imagery uh, that our system collects. That's pipe in a ditch. Um, the same pipe um, is on the upper right. That's LIDAR of that pipe at a, at a river crossing. Um, and then obviously all, all the GI, all the LIDAR data captured GIS data where you have contours, you have the actual pipe tubes and, and crossings and things like that. The same is true for any other subject matter, whether it's a mine, you want to have a surface model of the mine, you want the break lines of the toe slope and things like that, of, of, the, wall, of the mine walls and so forth. Um, all that can be generated in, in GIS. So just to get into a, a couple examples before the live demo, this is an environmental example. Um, this is of an open cut river crossing uh, for a pipeline. Uh, the image on the left is the raw LIDAR data. So you can see the trees, the temporary bridge. Uh, you can see the river crossing and, and the ditch for the pipe. And then to actually, uh, the purpose of this collection was to demonstrate to the government regulator how deep the ditch was for the pipe below the, the actual river crossing um, to meet environmental regulatory requirements and so forth and basically document where that pipe was going in uh, underneath the river and prove it. So uh, unlike just a 2D survey map, um, you know, an as-built drawing, this is actual 3D data that can be compared and, and direct measurements be taken from um, for basically the same cost or less of, of traditional, uh, traditional survey. So here's a couple of mining, or here's one mining example. Um, I'm going to show some of this data today. Um, these are actual images from our, our camera on the system. Here is uh, all the abandoned pipe that they found in the mine as they're excavating the mine. There is a pipe that was going through that wasn't on any of the as-builts or old drawings and so forth. Um, and so when you come across something like this, as opposed to just sending an email to someone, you can actually say, here's a photograph of it. This is where it is. Send it to, my, to someone. It's a, it's a great example of, of rapidly collecting data and, and having more data to share with people instantly than just you know a, a typed or, or written explanation of, of what you saw. Um, the image below is is obviously of the mine face, uh, the wall of the mine. You can see the different uh, the stratigraphy in the uh, in the aggregate. This is from an oil sands mine, um, and where you know in this particular case that the geologist for the mine was going around in their truck just with her iPhone taking pictures of things that were of interest. Um, with our system, it just drives around and quickly in and out and then flip through in the browser and, and look at actually all the photos and not have to um, have to manually do that. Uh, the image on the right is I'll, I'll show you live in a moment, but that's just of the point cloud, you know, and some of the measurement tools uh, we have. It doesn't show up very well in PowerPoint. Um, hopefully it shows it better when the demonstration. But that's an example of uh, an open pit uh, LIDAR. Uh, that particular example looks like it's about 10 meters. Uh, that wall face is, mine face is about 10 meters high. Um, it also looks like the LIDAR has been clipped in that particular example. Um, but just to round out the, the PowerPoint part of, of our discussion, um, the, the benefits of collecting LIDAR for an imagery for a 3D digital twin is from a pure construction maintenance standpoint, um, you know, if you, you want to collect data, if you want to model the mine, um, collecting mobile remote sensing data is safer. Um, excuse me. It is safer than walking around with equipment. It's 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 way faster, much more efficient, uh, therefore more uh, cost effective. Um, because the data is actually really dense, rich 3D data, it, it's it's really good from a quality assurance standpoint. You can see everything. You know, when you send surveyors out traditionally, whatever they don't write down um, is lost forever. In our data, you know, if you collect everything, it's there and you can always go back and look at it. Um, and especially as the, the asset changes through time, you can, you can track in, in great detail all the changes through time. Um, it also provides great evidence of compliance um, of whatever the contractor was contracted to do. Uh, excavate in a certain area, move this from here to there, uh, install this, whatever it was, you can actually, you know, you know, very specific time stamp 3D data of what the asset looked like at a given time. Um, so in terms of compliance with contracts, compliance with safety regulations and so forth, we have pure visual, visual and uh, evidence that can be interrogated uh, with 3D data. Then from an operations and integrity standpoint, uh, 3D data is it's a very rich data set. So you can do a lot more analytics than just from a, a traditional as-built. 
Um, as you've seen the imagery um, and what I'm going to demonstrate you for a second, the point cloud, it makes a very effective communication tool. We have all this great amount of indexed imagery um, that's geospatially referenced. Uh, you can really support communication with stakeholders internally and externally. Um, and then, of course, all that together um, is proof of the sustainability of the asset. You're collecting a tremendous amount of data um, on the asset during its life cycle, and it's and it's irrefutable evidence. So you can, if you're doing the job right, you can prove that you're doing it right. Question anytime, any question that comes up, you can bring up data and, and scientific analysis can be done on that data to prove it was done properly, or this is how it's changed through time. Um, it, it's true proven sustainability. So that being said. Um, I'm going to uh, just switch gears here and uh, open my web browser and share that with you. Um, give me a second here, move the right screen around, log back in, and I'll share again. Any questions uh, to this point so far? None? Okay, Let's see if I can share the screen again. <laughs> All right, you should see a, a map of, of North America um, centered on Calgary, of course. Um, this is what our Lux web viewer looks like. You know, I, I went through a login page to get here, um, but this is where every single one of our customers and partners start. In this, in this Lux web browser is where we do everything. Um, this is where there's all these, I won't go through them all in detail, but there's all the functions, all the functionality in the system. This is where after the end of the day, an operator out there collecting some data would use go into um, package upload and upload the data. From the game. This is where you do a re organize your projects, of what device was there, what data sets belong to which project, which customer, or which partner. This is where you upload uh, GPS base station data. Um, there's different ways to add third party data sets. So if you have, you know, like traditional 2D or 3D GIS or CAD data, it can be added to this actual map as well and shown and shown on here. It's, it's kind of a mini GIS. It's not designed to be your full GIS, but it's designed to, so if you have like the footprint of the mine, for example, that can be, yeah, that can show up in the drawing and so forth. Um, it's basically where everything is is done. Um, but I close that there. This is, you know, very basic, oh, sorry, not basic, very straightforward. A query tool to look for specific scans or specific projects. And what I'm going to do is actually we, we set up a um, a uh, uh, an example um, for you guys today. A uh, surface mine and some of the data. These are all other examples I can also show you. But this particular one uh, in Florida, Alberta. This is an aggregate um, mine, aggregate pit or storage area. I should say, not a mine. It's an aggregate storage area. Um, so here's some uh, 2D data. This is actually the trajectory of the device. Like it's the path the vehicle took to collect the data so you know where it is. Um, so as you can see, all these other scans, and I can show you some of the ones that have, uh, have come up, but these are, these are all examples. Um, this is where you can, if you know what you're looking for, you can query for it. You can say, hey, um, Bob made a, you know, had a really interesting scan of this one thing and everyone needs to see it. You can look for tags, you can search it by date, so you can get right down to a particular scan if you want, but otherwise most people kind of search geographically. In this area, I want to see the three scans that are of this one file or something like that. But so in this case, you, you select the scan that's of interest and you go up here to this button and that moves it into 3D. And here is a three point cloud of, of this aggregate pit. Um, that's the, uh, this is it in colorized. In this particular case, the um, uh, the operator was driving very fast through this area and the device was mounted a little bit low. So it didn't get a chance to actually capture the top of all the actual pit wall. But this is what a 3D point cloud looks like. Uh, many of you will be probably familiar with uh, like an elevation or color ramp version of, of 3D data or LIDAR data. So here's an example of it. So in this particular case, this was probably collected in about 30 seconds. Maybe I was in a truck with the guy. Um, like I say, he was driving pretty fast, but this whole thing was collected in about 30 or 45 seconds, less than a minute for sure. We drove in and drove out really quick. And this is the level of detail that uh, we're able to, uh, able to collect. Um, 
and like I said, in our system, there, there's very basic um, uh, 3D measurement tools that you can use. Um, there's annotation tools. You know, I won't go into all the detail, but there's there's a whole bunch of basic functionality in here for just the basic user. If you want to know the area of something or the volume, you know, what's the distance from you know from here to here, things like that. And then, you know, again, this is only this isn't a full GIS because all our customers have other GIS. Like uh, Helicon has GIS capabilities, we support GIS capabilities. Um, the actual mine might have GIS, geospatial or geomatics capabilities. So this data can then be go put into a, a, you know another GIS system for very detailed environmental analysis or some of, of, of monitoring and so forth. Um, so this is what, uh, you know, you can obviously see uh, an excavator here. Um, I don't know if it's uh, colorized it is here. Uh, it's turning out great for some reason, but, um, and there's a couple of other vehicles there. This is, uh, in this particular case, as I mentioned, the device is mounted in, in a sitting uh, upward facing position. Um, in, a, in a, for this actual collection, I would normally mount in downward facing position. But this is what, um, this is what the system looks like. You can see, and we were traveling, this is a very rich data set, but we were, as I mentioned, we were traveling very fast. You can even see the ruts and undulation in the, in the dirt on the ground from the heavy equipment. That's the level of detail that uh, you can see here. Um, another thing what I'm gonna do is, uh, just to give you another, uh, another view is I'm gonna turn this one off and I'm gonna go over to over to here. Um, this is an example, just to give you an idea. Yeah, okay, so here's a um, residential uh, power line uh, near Calgary, here's a creek and it's along uh, an access road. Um, but this is, uh, and I'll go to, uh, go to all the elevations. Hmm. Very classified, yeah, filtered one here. Um, so this is what a power line corridor looks like. And you can see, so this was probably collected at about 80 kilometers an hour. Um, and this gives you an idea of, you know, the, the level of detail that is that is collected. And then with that, to look at imagery, um, what you do is you come down here and you click the, hit the button, and here's the imagery for the actual uh, system. So if I wanted to see um, the image right here, I just click on that point. Um, didn't really click in the right spot, I think. Um, okay, so here's a, here's an actual power pole. You can bring it up. And here's, uh, here's that poll. Um, again, so this is all geospatially referenced. Uh, you can zoom in in great detail and look at it. Um, and all this is stored um, in the cloud. So because it's all Windows based too, so if this was something that was of interest to you for whatever reason, say the poll was broken, you could just right click it on it and just copy the image or save the image and put it right into an email or a text message or something like that and share it with someone and say, hey, uh, doctor, you have to go look at this, or hey, what do you think of this? Um, so that's one of the values of our system is that all the data is ready so quickly, um, and it's all geospatially referenced to itself. Um, you, if there was if this was if there was multiple passes here over you know multiple years, you could look at each photo at this one spot and see how things have changed over years. Not to mention the actual lidar at this one spot, you could see um, where it's actually changed um, over time. Um, so if I come down here too, you can see there's a road sign. Um, this is actually data that can clean up a little bit more, but it gives you an idea at speed, you know, driving fairly quickly, we collect a tremendous amount of, of data that can obviously get deposited. So if there is a substation here, maybe there's supposed to be once transformers on here or something, um, this could um, this could all be modeled in, in GIS or CAD. Um, that data, I think they're, yeah, if we go back to it here. Sorry. Where are we here? <laughs> um, so here's that photo of this particular spot. Um, yeah, so this has obviously been abandoned, this structure here, and that equipment has been moved off of it. Um, they've got some switches here. But that's the level of detail that our system provides. And again, this is this is collected at speed. So you could do an enormous amount of area, a mine pit in minutes to say half an hour or something like that, very, very quickly, very, very easily. And uh, uh, again, um, our system is designed that 
um, any novice person. You don't have to be a surveyor to operate our system. Just some, you need a, a young engineer, an EIT or someone in training just to go drive the truck and collect the data and upload it, upload it to the um, uploaded cloud. Um, so that kind of concludes my high level overview of, of Lux Modus um, and our technology. Uh, and I'd like to answer any questions that you have now um, or any other discussion you'd like to have about 3D mapping and, and how it can be used. I'll just stop sharing my screen maybe. Thank you. Terry, maybe I'll throw it back to you. Sarah, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you, yes. Uh, are there any questions for Mr. Hladi? You can also uh, type questions in the chat facility. I'm talking to our students if, uh, and other participants. If you have a question, you can, uh, even, you can ask it even in Greek and we'll translate it for our speakers. Maybe I can start with uh, some questions. Um, in uh, our minds, we have uh, two applications of, uh, let's say, related with uh, mapping. The one is the, uh, the calculation of volumes in uh, different times in order to compare and to uh, to know how much, uh, uh, to know the quantity of rocks that we have uh, excavated in a certain period. And the, the other application is uh, monitoring for uh, slope stability, for, for uh, detecting instabilities, let's say. Uh, the question is, is the accuracy of uh, uh, your system capable of doing uh, volume calculations or uh, slope stability monitoring. And uh, I want also to, to, to ask you to compare directly the, the system of LUX uh, uh, mo uh, LUX modules with uh, um, UAVs Mm -hmm. which are now very, very popular in all mines. Mm -hmm. uh, the PPC mines has uh, planes and helicopters, uh, and it's uh, relatively expensive, I can say. It's, the, the one costs about uh, 25,000 uh, euros. This is the one system. The other system is with based on total stations. Yeah. Can you compare uh, these uh, three technologies? Yeah, certainly. Um, so the first part of your question about uh, volumetrics and slope stability. So yeah, so our system produces a level of accuracy and precision at the centimeter level. Um, uh, the, the detail, uh, like so the LIDAR sensor, for example, has sub-centimeter accuracy and precision, where the, um, called the error bar, um, where the LIDAR comes in is because of, of GPS quality. Any given day that can change. So um, on a, generally we'd say our, our system has within a few centimeters uh, of, relative, of absolute accuracy. It has extremely high relative precision. Um, we find it directly aligns with survey relative distance. Um, but so when you're talking about volumetrics, yes, we, if we have a couple of few centimeters of relative accuracy, of, sorry, of absolute accuracy, when you're doing cubic meters of volume and so forth, um, our system is indistinguishable from any other system because just the volume of what you're doing, right? If you're looking at measuring the volume of, of this coffee cup, um, our system is going to give like a pretty, you know, is, is the, the error bar is going to be noticeable, right? But for the volume of my root of the office that I'm in, you wouldn't, it's, it's immeasurable. You, you wouldn't even be able to detect that, that error, right? Um, and our system, our Lux web viewer that you looked at, 
doesn't have a volumetrics tool right now, but we're looking at adding um, anytime it, it's a tool we can just add right in. So right in our web browser, but generally that kind of work is done in a GIS, particularly slope stability. Um, and again, because we're looking at only a few centimeters uh, of potential error in our, in our data, uh, it can, in my opinion, be definitely be used for slope stability because you're looking in a mine, you're looking at great scale, right? Um, over large distances. So, so our data will be as accurate or precise, accurate and precise as what you get from a UAV or a drone. Um, aircrafts are, you know, can be more or less comparable. Um, and, and that's out of the box. That's as, as is. If you actually have a ground control network, our LIDAR can actually be made like sent here to one kind of centimeter level of accuracy. So our system in terms of its accuracy and precision is completely comparable to a drone. Now a total station is designed to give millimeter accuracy, right? Um, that's traditional, traditional survey, right? Um, based on the skill of the surveyor, of course, which is true for any, any. Um, so what we have found um, from a, a total cost of ownership perspective, uh, one of the reasons that we're out there is because our system, we believe, is more cost effective um, for the application of the technology. If you're looking for millimeter precision, like if you're going to fabricate a joint, a pipe or something like that, or a ladder, um, you wouldn't use our system. You'd use a total station, right? Um, you wouldn't use a drone either. But if you're doing volumetrics like that, our system absolutely um, is, at the, is at the accuracy and precision for that type of work. Um, and um, our hardware is probably technically more expensive than the hardware of a drone. You have to look at the total cost of ownership standpoint of the person, the software, the training, insurance, all those other kind of components. So we are of the belief that, um, that from a mapping standpoint, you don't just have one tool, you have a variety of tools, right? You might for um, once a year collect satellite imagery, high resolution satellite imagery, or an aerial aircraft uh, collection of imagery of the mine, or maybe on a quarterly basis, something like that. But if you're looking to collect data on a daily basis, uh, drones and aircraft are just fast and too expensive. The other condition is that our other situation is that our data uh, can be collected at any time by any, uh, in any weather condition. Drones and aircraft, um, you get some temporal, uh, or in the timeline of when you can collect data, you get some variability in that drones and aircraft because of weather. A drone can't fly in bad weather. Say it's there's thunderstorms or it's raining, you can't fly a drone. Our system operates in the rain and snow all the time. Um, so uh, it's about choosing the tool that you want for your application. And and our our system is a is a great tool for mine application because it's so readily deployable. You deploy it in minutes. It, it's cost effective, um, and um, uh, you you've got complete, basically complete cost control of how much money you spend on the use of our system. Now. Um, in terms of aerial collection, sometimes for a mine in particular, you want a downward view of the mine, right? Now it's a question of, do you want that every day or every other week? You know, it's about planning your remote sensing program of what data do you need at what time? So um, our, we generally believe that in, in a lot of our customers, particularly on the pipelines, employ multiple tools. They do aerial collection with aircraft, with drones and with our system. And for some things like at a facility, they might use the total station. Um, the other thing that you should be noted that I haven't mentioned yet is that our um, technology ecosystem can incorporate third-party data. So if you collect a LIDAR with a drone or from an aircraft, that LIDAR can go into our Lux web. In fact, we actually have customers that don't use our hardware at all, and they have their own drones or they have their own aircraft. They still use Lux Cloud and Lux Web to look at the data, share that data. So there is that component as well. I didn't mention it yet. I, I definitely go back and add that to my presentation. Um, but our system is designed to incorporate any LIDAR. And, um, so you have that capability of adding different LIDAR data sets uh, to, to, uh, to, to Lux Web. Um, the other, um, I think I answered all the parts of your question, didn't I? Um, okay. I could go on about it forever. But uh, when, I, when I, I, one thing I would put to you, and it's a very self-serving comment though, um, is when you're looking at your technology and how you want to collect data, look at the total cost of ownership from a safety standpoint, regulatory standpoint. I, I, I'm, I love drones and drones are great, but they're not the answer to everything. And our system is not. 
you need multiple tools. Um, and the challenge with drones, although they provide a great aerial view, is the total cost of ownership, they are, they are more expensive, um, but they do give that great downward, that downward. They are very popular in mining, um, but they do come with limitations, just like our. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a couple of uh, questions for oh, Mrs. Lari. Um, you mentioned at some point that uh, your hardware is mostly used for open pit mines or surface mines. Uh, can it also be used underground? Uh, right now, uh, it can't. That wasn't a use case for us. We're, we're, our company is only five years old. We're, we're uh, prototyping that technology right now. There's a capability okay. called SLAM, uh, simultaneous locating and mapping that you have to deploy to use in a GPS denied environment. And um, particularly all those drones that you're hearing about that are used in mining right now, they have that capability so they can fly into tunnels and things like that yeah. in the ground. Um, and their entire navigation system is based around SLAM. So it actually produces a lower accuracy and precision than what our methodology produces mm -hmm. um, overall. Um, SLAM is less accurate and precise than GPS collection. But underground, there's no GPS, so you have to deploy SLAM. Um, we are working on um, that right now. We have some major rail customers that, um, excuse me for a sec. Um, we have some major rail customers that have a lot of tunnels and we're doing that before them. So we're, we're refining our, our underground map capability over the next few months. So we'll have that deployable in, in the new year. Okay, and a uh, question related to software. Yeah. Um, do you have filters? I, I guess you do, but uh, uh, yes. for removing vegetation or you know equipment on surfaces, anything non-related to the surface you're trying to model. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. In short, we have buttons that are literally one like make a bare earth, for example. You can just mm -hmm. uh, click one button. You can play with the filter a little bit to fine tune right. it. You can instantly create a bare earth. And we're also partnering right now in the process of partnering with some other companies that provide just pure. LIDAR classification tools, and mm -hmm. then we're going to be incorporating into our LOTS web on a per use basis. Uh, so you can, if you just want the power lines, or, you want or maybe you do want the vegetation, um, those two, those one button, one press button um, tools will be deployed over the next. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Any other questions? Are there any questions in the chat? I don't see any in there. No. Another question. Uh, can you give us an idea about the time required for data processing, let's say for an area of 100 hectares? Uh, so uh, you go out and collect the data, the data gets uploaded to the cloud, 100 hectares uh, would be available, like once it's been uploaded to the cloud, it would be available in 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, if it was really complex data, maybe an hour. Um, now that's without base station data. Uh, normally, uh, for those who don't know, um, when you apply base station control data to GPS, um, you wait a whole day until you get the base station data because you want the correction data from the national um, from the, the, the provider of secondary correction. Um, but as soon as base station data so, uh, is applied, it's fine tuned by a few centimeters, but that initial provisional upload of data to the cloud is just, uh, we have very advanced parallel processing in the cloud. So say you went out and scanned an area and you had like five scans, you scan five kind of passes or something like that. Um, or if you had 50 scans, it all takes the same amount of time. We spin up the number of servers in the cloud required to process so we've got a hypervisor system that looks at the data sets, loads the number of servers needed, and that basically processes. So um, the longest it ever takes, you know, if you have, like there's been scan times where we've had like several hundred scans come in, and that might take an hour. Um, but they, and as soon as they're processed, they're available. So the first scan is available. Next scan is available. So it's minutes to tens of minutes. Okay. Uh, just to add something, uh, Joseph uh, mentioned that already, but uh, I wanted to, to stress that out. 
Um, if we uh, to 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 have um, to to produce a, a 3D mapping via the Lux Modus technology, uh, you only need to uh, mount the Lux Gear uh, collection platform on a vehicle in a configuration suited to your requirements. Plug in the Lux Gear to an appropriate power source in the vehicle and hit record on the provided tablet to start the data collection. This work. Uh, can be done by anyone. Uh, that's why uh, Lux Modus says that uh, they democratize the uh, uh, 3D mapping. So an engineer or a geotechnical, a geotechnical engineer or a civil engineer who wanders around, drives around the mine can collect, simply collect this data uh, while uh, uh, driving to go on, on other tasks of, of theirs. Uh, then the collection, as soon as the collection has been completed, the data is uploaded directly from the tablet to the Lux, gear, to the Lux cloud for processing. And all data uh, is instantly post-processed and uh, colorized and uh, is viewable in the Lux web 3D viewer many minutes after upload, as uh, uh, Joseph said. And uh, the most imp the important thing here is that this um, uh, collection of data, collection and uh, uh, production of the and mapping uh, can, can be done repeatedly. So Mr. Robos in uh, PPC, the PPC director, can uh, 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 sitting in his office can control uh, the reclamation, uh, the reclamation progress by getting uh, uh, data, day after day or after one week. Uh, and uh, this is a very quick, very quick and inexpensive uh, method in comparison with, uh, let's say, total station and, uh, or the, uh, uh, the drones, uh, use of, of drones. So this, this is uh, what I want you to, 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 to say, that asset management can be easily done uh, and uh, without uh, spending lots of money. Thanks for uh, adding that, Terry. That is something that we, uh, we we didn't go into from a commercial standpoint. Our system, you don't have to buy it. You can just literally rent it for a day. Most customers rent it for a week or a month. Some of them have some that they own or that they rent for a long period of time, like a year on a yearly cycle. You can literally just rent it for a so you, you've got complete cost control. Of, so maybe you need it for one week every month. There's <coughs> terms that you can provide. Allow that. Uh, I see there's a question in the chat um, in, in Greek. I don't know if somebody wants to um, translate that for me. Um, I only started learning Greek this morning, so I, I'm not 100% up to the That was actually me, Mr. Hladi, prompting people to type questions so it's not actually okay. yeah. all right well i appreciate <laughs> sorry that. About that no that's right i appreciate you asking uh something more um i i i don't know what are the requirements the accuracy requirements uh, in um, uh, mapping a mine uh, I, I don't believe they're more than a few centimeters in horizontal and uh, vertical uh, level, uh, with the exception maybe of the, in case of uh, the slope stabilization projects where uh, they, sh they should, they would probably require millimeters uh, to accuracy in millimeters to, to fall in pipelines. Um, I, I come from pipelines. Uh, yeah, guys uh, from pipeline sector, it's millimeters because you, you need to uh, to estimate the slope movements very, very carefully and very accurately. Uh, but I don't know what, what is the accuracy required uh, for stabil slope stabilization in a, in a mine, for example. Probably uh, Lux uh, gear can capture also uh, stabilization uh, if if 
the requirements are not uh, uh, are not stricter than the ones I mentioned before. One thing that I'll, I'll add too, when you're when you're talking about analysis, too, there's there's absolute accuracy and relative accuracy. Um, the accuracy I've been telling quoting you guys uh, is absolute accuracy. So where in the world is it within a few centimeters? Our relative accuracy is sub centimeters. So if you have two scans of the same um, area, like say you're mapping the, the, the wall of a mine, um, relative accuracy is is centimeter or less. Like the two point clouds will line up perfectly um, in 3D space. We can make them line up by ground control and so forth very, very easily. Um, and then you can do that millimeter level kind of accuracy. But if you want to know in terms of like a UTM coordinate, overall, like they might be off position slightly from here to there. But if you're just trying to do a relative comparison in your mind grid from one one time collection after to another, um, that that's extremely precise. That's it's the absolute accuracy where where we're in the centimeter level, but in the um, relative accuracy, we're two or less, one or less, uh, pardon me, centimeters. And with ground control, you can definitely take it to less than you know less than a centimeter. So any, any other questions? Uh, so, Teresa, I think that uh, there are not any other questions uh, from the audience. So, of course, there is a possibility <clears throat> if something is to be comes out at later stage, then uh, yeah. the guy, the the colleagues can communicate or to send an email asking for details about this. And this is a channel yeah. of communication that is uh, very easy to be followed. Uh, Mr. Rubos wants to say something. Yes, yes. Thank you for the very interesting uh, presentation and uh, a lot of uh, uh, issues regarding our minds uh, can be uh, in uh, the application of uh, what you have presented. Um, we are very interesting, of course, to see the um, application regarding um, our transfer of land to the new users, as we uh, had explained in uh, our uh, previous meeting, and also the um, stability issues, slow stability, as uh, Professor Pavlodakis uh, mentioned, uh, which are very critical in the post-mining period. Uh, of course, we can discuss uh, further details uh, regarding the applications and uh, together with uh, Dr. Spanidis, we shall be in uh, close uh, cooperation. So thank you again for the nice presentation and my colleagues uh, here uh, can uh, uh, after that uh, see uh, the PowerPoint presentation, and maybe if there are questions, of course, they can send email asking. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, of course, um, we are open to answer any questions also in the next days, um, uh, as soon as uh, your uh, colleagues and the university people and students um, will uh, be more familiar uh, in the, with the technology. Uh, and um, uh, of course, um, we can give you more details if required regarding the slope stability or whatever 
specific issues uh, you have uh, in the in the mind. So uh, I have worked in slope stabilization for pipeline for 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 three or more years in geotechnical. Yes. So I have a very good uh, sense of the slope stability issues. Uh, Actually, I don't know how how a mine, uh, what are the requirements of a mine, but we can um, uh, work together with uh, Joseph and his team, and uh, share with you some some uh, some opinions of ours on how uh, stabilization can be affected. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity you gave to us to uh, present to you uh, the mapping technologies. And uh, hopefully we will uh, uh, hear from you again in the near future uh, regarding your projects. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you everyone for your time. I really appreciate it. I uh, hope you have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much again. I want also to thank you. And uh, I must say that uh, I supervise now uh, a PhD uh, which is related uh, to the monitoring of uh, slopes in surface mines, in the lignite mines, with uh, uh, UAVs. And uh, probably this is a, an area for cooperation between uh, our university and your companies. And uh, we can discuss uh, about that and uh, exchange opinions and so. Yeah, it would be very interesting to talk about that. And uh, Mr. Pavlovakis, as uh, Joseph uh, mentioned before, uh, the U UAV uh, da data capture via UAV can be incorporated in the mm -hmm. LUX cloud. And uh, uh, actually, it's only the, the data collection system that changes in, in, in that mm -hmm. case. Uh, so there is flexibility here. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Have a nice day. Have a nice day. Take care. Nice.